Um, thank you, Governor um, Bluestone. Thank you. It's a real honor to be here. Before I um, begin, I have to do some shameless advertising as I see my colleague Kevin. Um, for those of you who are interested in this subject and related subjects, and actually some of the things I'm about to talk about, about health, we are having another event next Thursday at the law school, a public lecture on um, an expert panel on human rights and social determinants of health at 1.30 next Thursday in 240 Doxer Hall. And you're all invited to continue the conversation next week. Have I done my job? Okay, okay. Uh, okay, thank you. So I want to talk about some issues that about the future of the Affordable Care Act, um, and more broadly about the future of the health of health of Americans. And I want to do it by focusing a little bit on some issues that I think of are as under the radar, some of the issues that are not being discussed, or at least discussed amply during this election cycle. To do that, I want to make three um, opening premises. First, health care, which is really the, supposedly the topic today, but I'm fudging my assignment. Health care is critically important to our health, but it's not the only thing. Health is about more than health care. Second, the Affordable Care Act, but I'm not calling it Obamacare, because in the first debate, the president told me to do that. Um, so he likes Obamacare. So Obamacare is about more than health care. And third, the Supreme Court's ruling last June in the NFIB case, the Obamacare case, will affect our health broadly beyond its impact on Obamacare. So first, the idea that health isn't only about health care or is determined solely by health care. Um, Without question, access to health care is critical. We know that tens of thousands of Americans die each year because they do not have access to affordable health care. We also know that tens of thousands of Americans die each year because although they have access to health care, they don't have high quality health care. The health care they have is not very good often. And we should we need to do a lot more to improve the quality of our health care. And if Don Berwick had been here tonight, he could have talked about that because he's the true uh, guru and expert on that. But at a broad population level, we look across the population of the nation. Other factors, so-called determinants of health, next week's lecture, um, are actually more important than health care. Factors such as poverty, air quality, water quality, the safety of our food and drug supply, our access to tobacco, firearms. These are the things that actually affect our health at a broad population level. This slide shows the relationship between poverty and inequality <coughs> in health. And you'll notice that the United States, of course, is an extraordinarily high-income country. But we actually are a country also with significant inequality. And we have worse health outcomes than almost all other wealthy countries, and including countries that are far less wealthy than we are, such as Spain and Ireland and Greece. That's because although poverty is important when thinking about health, and I think it's easy to get your head around why poor people are less healthy. Inequality itself seems to be highly correlated with better health outcomes. But there are other things too, and I alluded to them a moment ago. A couple of years ago, the Centers for Disease Control did published a report in the MMRW, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Reports, about the 10 top great achievements in public health. These were the 10 great victories across the 20th century that they could point to as making significant strides in improving the life expectancy and reducing the infant mortality rates of Americans. Vaccination was up there, of course. Motor vehicle safety, we don't tend to often think about that. But things like seatbelts make an enormous difference, right? 
seat belts matter, airbags, safe for road designs, safe for workplaces, control of infectious disease, which has something to do with healthcare, but also has a lot to do with other things, the work of public health folks. Declines in death from coronary heart disease and stroke has a lot to do with health access, statins, and getting the, you know, the stents when you need it, but it also has to do with activity, smoking less, eating healthy, getting the trans fats out of the food. And I can go on and on. The point is that public health, what government does, and here's the other part of this, all of these things, government is involved in. Public health is what we as a society, what government, with the help of government, does to keep populations healthy. These are not the issues that have been debated in this election. <laughs> in fact, we've been debating about whether Obamacare is or is not like Romney care, and of course, as the governor has told us, it's awfully similar. <laughs> but actually, the lives of Americans what really will count in the long run for affecting most lives are issues that have really been under the radar, not discussed, not mentioned in the debates. Okay? Try to find public health on Governor Romney's website. You can't find it. Um, but these are issues that are touched upon in the Affordable Care Act in important ways. And these are also issues that the fate of the Affordable Care Act will determine in more indirect ways. So let me briefly go through the Affordable Care Act, and the governor has already given us a great introduction, so I'm going to be really quick here. A lot of it has to do with reforming the private insurance market. Okay, This is the part of the Affordable Care Act that most closely resembles Romney Care. Right? It, it's, the, it's the part that resembles Nixon's plan, right? It, or at least has its roots. There are mandates for individuals and employer, large employers. Of course, that's what we mentioned the Blue Cup has made about. Establishment of insurance exchanges, tax credits, and subsidies to help individuals buy insurance and to help small employers pay for it. The prohibitions on pre existing conditions prohibits insurance companies from imposing lifetime caps, prohibits rescission of policies, so that's medical loss of type of ratio, and um, mandates coverage of essential benefits. The public insurance parts, which tend to be in Titles two and three of the Act, are actually in some ways the most important parts in terms of coverage of people. Um, and some of this also resembles what we did here in Massachusetts, and particularly the first line here. We expanded Medicaid to cover all citizens with incomes under 133% of the federal poverty level. It's a huge change in the whole idea of what Medicaid is. Now Medicaid is going to be solely about income, not about your demographic group. Do you have children? Do you not have children? Right? It, what age are you? Now Medicaid is about income. It extends funding for the Children's Health Insurance Program, reduces and then eventually eliminates the so-called donut hole for Medicare, increases preventive services for Medicare beneficiaries. There are a whole bunch of pilot uh, payment and delivery system <coughs> reforms designed to get M Medicare pay, uh, providers to provide better care, to better coordinate, to be paid for performance instead of simply by doing more procedures, supports research about what works in healthcare, and of course reduces payments to the Medicare Advantage plans, or we could say overpayments, and that's what much of the fuss has been about. But there are also all these other public health initiatives in the Act, especially in Title IV, but some of them are scattered throughout the Act. Increased access for preventive care. It supports employee wellness programs, supports development and funding for enhancement of the primary care workforce, for primary care physicians and primary care nurses, support for the public health systems and community health centers. There are community tra uh, transformation block grants um, in 
2011, CDC gave over $105 million under this new vision of the ACA to implement community level programs to prevent chronic disease, um, programs to prevent tobacco use in communities, to increase physical activity, bike sharing programs. You've seen all this. But there's other stuff. There's support for tobacco cessation for Medicaid beneficiaries. Nothing kills us as much as tobacco. There is a breastfeeding provision. How many people knew that the ACA requires employers to allow working mothers time to breastfeed in a private, clean place? Breastfeeding is really important for infant health. The ACA has a provision for that. Nobody knows about it. Okay? Menu labeling. There's a, a starting in 20, with the enactment of the act in 2010, but it's not going to go into effect until the FDA comes out with its regulations this fall, the ACA requires chain restaurants to have calorie labeling. And we've been seeing the adoption of this. And uh, last month, Starbucks, uh, excuse me, McDonald's announced that they're going to start labeling as they really have to. Um, this is, again, not what the debate has been about, and it wasn't what the legal debate, at least on the surface, was about. It was all about the mandate and freedom and states' rights. But as this cartoon, I think, perhaps unintentionally suggests, the debate about all oh, the mandate and the federalism was really a much broader question getting into public health prevention. So let me turn to the Supreme Court's case. Um, NFIB versus Sibelius. Again, all eyes, everybody was focused last June on the Supreme Court's decision, would the mandate live or would the court strike down the individual mandate, which had come to the opponents of Obamacare to epitomize the usurpation of liberty, right? Of government tyranny. I don't want to make, right? It's tyranny to require people to have insurance. Well, of course, CNN got it wrong, at least initially. The mandate was upheld. As is widely known, Chief Justice Roberts surprised observers by ruling and joining the four so-called liberal justices, that the mandate was a constitutional exercise of Congress's taxing authority. More specifically, Chief Justice Roberts said that even though Congress didn't call it a tax, it was a tax for constitutional purposes. Or actually, what was a tax was the enforcement mechanism. Okay, Because it was going to be collected by the IRS, you only had to pay it if you were a taxpayer. It was, it didn't have the, what we call in the law business, the men's raise, the intent requirements that we normally have for criminal penalties. It was a tax, he said. And the fact that it had a regulatory purpose, well, that doesn't matter. We know lots of taxes have regulatory purposes. So Congress's broad power to tax and the mandate survived as a tax, said the court by five to four. Okay, that's great. And it meant that the ACA implementation could continue. Of course, we don't know what will happen after the election and in January. But it allowed the ACA to march on towards 2014 when the mandate would come into effect. But there's a lot else in this opinion. And Chief Justice Roberts wrote an opinion. No one else joined it. It was just for himself, by himself, about the Commerce Clause, which was the main, most anticipated part of the decision. right? And four justices, the four more conservative justices on the court, also wrote about the Commerce Clause. And Essentially, they said the same thing, which means that we have five votes, a majority, <laughs> saying that Congress did not have the power, that it exceeded its power to regulate interstate
interstate commerce when it passed the mandate. And the argument that Chief Justice Roberts gave us was that Congress can regulate Congress, oh, excuse me, Congress can regulate commerce, but it cannot compel commerce, okay? Because after all, if they could require you to buy health insurance, they can require you to buy broccoli. He didn't actually use broccoli, he said vegetables. <laughs> and it's really interesting, he never explained, because he's going on, right, this, this is the parade of horribles. And Justice, and Justice Ginsburg, in her opinion, which was in the dissent on this point, called it the broccoli horrible. He's going on about this horrible as if, you know, if the government could make you buy health insurance, then they could make you buy broccoli, and the next thing you know, right, we're in Stalin's Russia. I mean, you can say that, but it kind of reads like that. And you're thinking, our liberty is gone, right? What is more important than the right not to be by broccoli? But two pages before, he just told us that they could tax you to death if you don't buy broccoli. So actually, they can make you buy broccoli, or they could tax all you. From, so what the di what's the difference? And he never explains it. He never explains it. None of the justices who do the Congress will explain why it is so, why liberty depends on Congress not being able to <coughs> compel us to buy broccoli, but they can tax us to buy broccoli, where after all, he already admitted that the power to tax is the power to regulate. This is an inconsistency never discussed. But anyway, I digress. <laughs>
struck down maximum hours laws, because after all, Congress can't, in a sense, there's liberty of contract, freedom, right? Workers should be free to work 10 hours a day. Children should be free to work. It violates that individual liberty. And there are strains of it in this decision. We'll get back to that. Okay? So that's the broccoli issue. But there's the stealth part of the decision, which I think is actually the most important part of the decision. Seven justices, Chief Justice Roberts, joined by Justices Breyer and Kagan, and the four conservative justices, concluded that Congress exceeded its power under the General Welfare Clause to require states to expand Medicaid. Laura talked about how the ACA expanded Medicaid. The ACA Medicaid provision, like all Medicaid provisions since 1965, was enacted under Congress's general welfare power. It is what we know as a tax and spending or conditional spending law. Congress says to the state of Massachusetts, Governor Dukakis, we'll give you lots of money if you cover poor people and give them health insurance. And the states could say yes or no. They could walk. For a long time, Arizona didn't join up. But eventually, all 50 states joined up. And they said, we'll take the money, we'll play by your rules. OK? Congress is in regulating. They're offering the states a deal. This is the way, this is actually the key way the federal government has been regulating in all kinds of areas since the New Deal. We call it cooperative federalism. It's actually something Republicans have usually liked because they work with the states. They give the states money. They let the states implement it, right? But they have to put some strings because how can the federal government spend money and not give any strings? Or so was the theory. In the ACA, the federal government gave the states more money, but it's basically said this is now what Medicaid is. And you lose your Medicaid money if you don't now cover everyone under 133. 26 states challenged this. They said it was unconstitutional. Everybody, at least initially, thought this was a losing argument. The US Supreme Court has never struck down, until last year, a conditional spending law as unduly coercive on the states. Never. Never found one. We've got tons of these laws. We've got dozens and dozens of these laws. I can't name them all. There's so many. All of the lower courts hearing the Obamacare case threw out the Medicaid challenge. Even very conservative justices who said, who bought the broccoli issue. Even broccoli hitting judges threw this. Seven justices found that the Medicaid expansion was unconstitutional. Unduly coercive on the states. Now we don't have a majority opinion on this point. I would even go further. I would say we don't have a coherent theory or a coherent explanation as to its unconstitutionality. Chief Justice Roberts, who did not write the plurality opinion, but was the dispositive, he was the decider in this case, he seemed to argue that the Medicaid expansion was unconstitutional for two reasons. One, it somehow qualitatively transformed Medicaid because it took Medicaid and turned it into a program for America's neediest families. <laughs> but whatever, that's what he said. And second, because, and by the way, Medicaid had been changed, amended, expanded dozens of times before, since 1965. But this expansion, he seems to say, was somehow the one that magically transformed it. The expansion that set all children up to 133, that wasn't magical. This is the magic one. The second point he suggested was that there's so much money here. Medicaid is up to more, it's, it's a huge chunk of state revenues. And so to threaten the states, <coughs> We're taking away such a huge chunk of their revenue if they don't expand. <clears throat> would be 
the unconstitution. Oh, there's one point I have to mention that I didn't mention. The expansion itself doesn't cost the states anything for a few years. The federal government was paying 100% of the expansion until 2016. And then thereafter, it doesn't, at least as Britain was going to pay, never go below 90%. So it was not, for most states, this is a real good deal. Nevertheless, it's so much money it could be lost if they didn't do it. It was somehow unduly coercive. It was like putting a gun to the head of the states. The four other justices who wrote an opinion on this, Justices Thomas, Alito, Kennedy, and Scalia, didn't talk as much about the magical transformation. They just talked about the amount of money and the idea that state legislatures were being put given a deal they couldn't refuse, and if they refused, then their population would be federally taxed and have to support other states. Think about what that means, federalism. <laughs> that it violates states' rights to tax the people of one state to support people of another state. Very troubling. <coughs> well, for some of us in states that give the federal government more than we get back, that might not be such a in any event, so seven justices said the Medicaid expansion was unconstitutional. Chief Justice Roberts, with Breyer and Kennedy, however, said that it could be with, upheld as long as the expansion was viewed as an option for the states. And they joined with the other four more liberal justices to say, okay, the expansion can go forward, but as a state option. In other words, it's another thing that a state could opt into or not opt out of, okay? By taking away that requirement for the expansion, it <coughs> said it saved it. The four conservative justices <coughs> disagreed. They said the expansion was so integral to the act as a whole that the whole act needs to fall. So what does this all mean? Well, first for the future of Medicaid, um, this map, which was made by a colleague of mine um, and a panel that I was in a week, a week ago, um, is actually already out of date, but since I'm not smart enough with technology, I couldn't figure out how to do it. This map shows the states that have already declined the option. Um, and last week, Mississippi announced that it too would refuse Medicaid even though the states will not have to pay anything for the first two years. Um, the CBO had estimated that the Medicaid expansion part of the ACA would have covered, was intended to cover, 17 million Americans. It's the single biggest part of the ACA's increased coverage was Medicaid. And then after the Supreme Court's decision, they estimated that Medicaid expansion would only cover 11 million Americans, meaning that 6 million more Americans would now remain uninsured. Um, of course, it's a, you know, I, I don't know how the CBO has particular uh, insight because this is political second guessing. And we're not going to really know what the states are going to do until after the election. Some states may be grandstanding and saying they're not going to do it until the election, and then if Obama wins and the ACA goes forward, some of them may. We just don't know, okay? But certainly, many states, we can probably figure, will not expand, and Medicaid will not reach as far, and many more Americans will remain uninsured. You will also notice, perhaps, that the states that have rejected the expansion, are A, the states we often think of as the red states, and B, are the states that have many of the states with the highest levels of uninsurance in the first place. But I want to argue and suggest that there's much greater constitutional uncertainty now, that the only, that there's actually a lot more we don't know than simply will Mitt Romney win and success, be successful in repealing Obamacare. We don't know that. 
And we don't know if oh, President Obama wins and, and the ACA continues, what the states will do. We don't know that. I want to suggest that the whole constitutional structure of government, especially the federal governments, playing a role in keeping us healthy is now in doubt. Or at least there are question marks. That there is a lot of constitutional uncertainty. One obvious target and most clear is the Medicaid, Medicaid maintenance of Medicaid provision. The ACA actually required states to keep in Medicaid the people who were in Medicaid before Medicaid expanded. Because remember what the federal government was going to do was cover the new population 100%. So what they didn't want the states to do was gain it, take everyone off of Medicaid, and then re-enroll them under the new plan. That would have been really smart, right? The governors would love that. Right? Because Medicaid now pays about 50 to 60% in most states the federal program, so they didn't want states to try to get that extra revenue. So there's a maintenance of effort provision in Medicaid. State of Maine is challenging the constitutionality of the maintenance of effort provision, and is basically saying that the court's decision about the expansion applies to the maintenance of effort. And I'll tell you, a lot of constitutional commentators think the state of Maine may mean this under the court's decision. And a lot of constitutional scholars are now saying, gee, every Medicaid change since 1965 can be questioned. Oh, the thing about expanding kids to 133 a couple, 20 years ago? That's questionable. Change the, that's a magic question, change. How far can we go with Medicaid? I don't know the answer. The courts will decide. But there are lots of other federal laws that look a lot like Medicaid. None of them are quite as big. And if it's dollar amount, then Medicaid is unique. But there are a whole lot of other federal laws that are structurally similar. I put up their IDEA. IDEA. Anyone know what that is? Massachusetts, we call it 766. What is that? Yeah. Special ed, disability. Individuals with Disability Education Act. You know what it is? It's a conditional spending law. And the difference is the government feds pay less than they do for Medicaid. But the state, the federal government gives the states money and tells the states, you gotta do X, Y, and Z. You've got and there's a whole lot of detailed regulations. And those regulations have changed over time, as regulations are allowed to do. Are the new regulations now unconstitutional? Because that changed the program from when the states signed up originally in 1974? I don't know. Nobody knows. Title IX. Anybody know Title IX? Well, you know what Title IX is? Title IX is a Civil Rights Act that's tagged to receipt of federal money. Is that unconstitutional? We don't know the answer. Okay? But there are other issues going on, too, besides the Medicaid. I talked about how the broccoli argument affects, has broader resonance about individual rights. Well, just a few weeks, uh, a couple days ago, Liberty College, um, Liberty College, the Supreme Court asked the Department of Justice to comment upon, to respond to Liberty College's claims that Obamacare is unconstitutional as a violation of individual liberty, including the First Amendment, their First Amendment religious rights, but broader their rights and their liberty rights. We thought the Supreme Court had settled the general constitutionality of the ACA. Why is the Supreme Court asking the Solicitor General to respond and not just throwing the petition for cert out? I don't know. Even if the Supreme Court eventually decides not to hear the Liberty College case, this argument about individual freedom and regulation interfering with freedom is percolating. The religious freedom argument is percolating. Right? Remember, remember the war against religion or the war against women, depending on which cable TV channel you can <laughs> 
Um, as part of the essential benefits plan, the Department of Health and Human Services issued a, res uh, a regulation saying that access to contraceptive care was an essential health benefit. And they actually gave employers who disagreed with this a one-year safe harbor before they had to implement it. And then they came back after there was all this brouhaha and all this, you will recall all of that last winter, and they changed it and they said that employers who have conscientious objections to contraceptives don't have to provide it, their insurers have to provide it. Okay. That did not satisfy all who have objections. Um, in part because some employers are self-insurers, and so the employer and the insurer are the same. There's been a, oh, around, I think more than 35 lawsuits have been filed around the country challenging the contraceptive mandate. Um, and relatively recently, over the summer, um, one court, in federal district court in Colorado, found that the mandate, the contraceptive mandate, probably violated what is known as the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Another federal court um, found that the, it was upheld, the contraceptive ban, uh, mandate, under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and also under the First Amendment, which means these cases are now ready to go to the Court of Appeals, and don't be surprised if this issue does not get to the Supreme Court. But now I want to end with talking about corporate speech, Citizens United. But it's not just Citizens United, which of course powerfully affects our health care. There, last July, or was it August? The DC Court of Appeals struck down, and this is not part of Obamacare, but it struck down an FDA regulation mandating graphic warning labels on cigarettes. Um, as a violation of the corporate speech of Philip Morris and other tobacco companies. In some ways, those cases are very different than the ones I've just been talking about, but there are lots of similarities that I could also talk about, but I'm running out of time, so I won't. But I will say that what really matters for the health of Americans, I think, is not simply the maintenance or repeal of Obamacare, but that the judicial decisions it is provoked <coughs> will have profound effects for all of the many public health efforts of the government, and that the election matters because it will determine the constitutional right of the federal government to try to protect the health of Americans. Thank you.